Dustin studied uh, languages in Iran and Egypt before completing graduate work in Islamic philosophy and Sufism at the University of Georgia. His published articles include Sohrabadi and the Problem of Universals, Rudiments of a Prozan uh, Hermeneutics, and Proving God with Plato. Furthermore, uh, he has published articles, uh, other articles, including Becoming What One Is, and they are, they are forthcoming articles, I'm sorry, Becoming What One Is, A Liberative Knowledge and Human Perfection in the Writings of Sayyid Hussein Nas, to be published in Mysticism and Ethics in Islam, edited by Bilal Orfali, uh, Atif Khalil, and Muhammad Rassum by American University of Beirut Press. And Fear, Deeds, and the Roots of Human Difference, A Divine Breath from al Ghunavi's Nafahad by Brill. Uh, the title of his talk is Sayyid Hussein Nasr's Metaphysical Theodicy. Um, many of you heard Dr. Nasr speak yesterday. Um, so the goal for this talk will just be to flesh out the essential points um, and also to address certain details of his perspective, which is very interesting, I think, and uh, hopefully worth hearing about more. Um, this should be just about exactly 30 minutes. So since I'm just going to read through it, um, inshallah, the timing should be OK. <clears throat> this is our final came. The problem of evil, as it came to be known, can be succinctly stated as follows. If God is perfectly loving and good, why is there evil in the world? Although ancient and medieval thinkers contemplated the nature of evil and discussed the question of how it can or cannot be traced back to God, it took until the modern period for philosophers to start reasoning from the existence of evil to the inexistence of God. Given the long and rich history of pre-modern discourses on evil, what explains this delay? At first blush, a few main logical possibilities present themselves. Either the ancients and medievals simply lacked the critical acumen and or impartiality necessary to fully appreciate the relevant contradiction and draw out its atheistic implications, or they possessed these qualities but opted not to express themselves openly, or the problem of evil is only inaccurately considered a genuine problem to begin with from which point of view its emergence would be symptomatic of an intellectual decline. For the prominent contemporary philosopher and scholar of Islam, Sayyid Hussein Nasser, whose comments on the problem of evil form the subject of this talk, not only is the thesis of decline correct, but it also happens that understanding what exactly was lost opens the way toward definitively resolving the problem of evil here and now. Stated simply, the issue for Nasser goes back to conceptions of knowledge or to epistemology. Is it possible to know God or isn't it? And if it is possible, how? In certain pre-modern philosophical traditions, let's call them broadly platonic, it was said that one could directly verify the existence of God through a form of knowing referred to as gnosis, gnosis in Greek, ma'rifa in Arabic, etc. Furthermore, the highest expressions of the science that came to be called metaphysics, which deals with first principles, proceeded from this special form of knowledge which was itself said to be not only supra-rational, above reason, but also infallible, owing to its non-duality, or to the fact that in it, the Gnostic became extinguished in that which was known. Indeed, Nasser has not been shy to say that, quote, if all men could be taught metaphysics, there would be no atheists and agnostics, end quote. Nasser's theodicy, or his solution to the problem of evil, is therefore noteworthy for its vigorous defense of the validity of both gnosis and the articulations of metaphysical truth rooted in it in a time when, generally speaking, neither is taken seriously anymore as a genuine form of knowledge. In contrast to contemporary thinkers who disregard gnosis in engaging with the problem of evil, Nasser places it at the heart of his theodicy, since for him, no fully satisfactory theodicy is possible without it. Insofar as one approaches the problem exclusively from the perspective of either exoteric theology or rationalistic philosophy, it is bound to remain insoluble, according to Nasser, who explains its historically corrosive effect on religious faith in the West in terms of a lack of access to sufficiently integral expositions of metaphysics, or to what he alternatively refers to as sacred science. Moreover, the qualification integral here is significant given the fact that anyone with a library card or an internet connection 
is now free to peruse the whole of Plato or Plotinus. For if, as Nasser claims, metaphysics involves more than just book learning, the situation arguably becomes one of compound ignorance. Whenever a human collectivity suffers from a dearth, not only of people who are capable of penetrating down to the real intentions underlying this or that text theoretically, but also those individuals who have assimilated the relevant truths existentially. This point leads to the other half, so to speak, of Nasser's metaphysical theodicy, the import of which extends beyond the necessary doctrinal considerations into the practical concerns of human life. For Nasser, comprehensively addressing the problem of evil requires taking account of the human experience of evil. His theodicy, therefore, has much to say about how one should understand the reality of suffering. So even if, unlike some thinkers, Nasser does not find it necessary to appeal via the purificatory aspect of suffering to the providential role played by evil in the cosmos in order to vindicate God, the holism of his perspective nevertheless demands drawing the various connections that he takes to obtain between the objective and subjective aspects of any given phenomenon. In this case, between evil as a fact about the world out there and evil as productive of suffering. As for the contemporary relevance of Nasser's theodicy, it consists first and foremost, one might argue, in the timelessness of its essential content, which must always be relevant ipso facto, at least insofar as one affirms the principle of the timeliness of the timeless, and specifically in as much as human beings are always and everywhere suffering. But regarding the question of relevance and its more extrinsic aspects, namely those pertaining to the social and political domains, one could mention the sense in which Nasser's approach to evil and suffering might serve as an antidote to hysteria, the destructive power of which doubtless becomes exacerbated in information societies and internet cultures. Anyone who has lived and reached some degree of maturity will know the power of negative experiences and influences to consume a life and waste it. If a person were to understand not only why evil exists, but also that it must exist, he or she would be in the best position possible to conquer it. Since equanimity born of knowledge obviously conduces to effective action, and action in the absence of knowledge is effective only by accident, as it were. The following is divided into three sections. The first will outline Nasser's solution to the problem of evil. The second will present his views on suffering. And the third will explore at least one way in which his theodicy might be elaborated upon on the basis of his own principles. In particular, I will discuss the relationship between the problem of evil and that of free will and predestination, which Nasser discusses, but only in brief. In Nasser's exposition of metaphysical truth, God, who is the supreme good, is said to be both absolute and infinite. With goodness in this context entailing munificence, absoluteness entailing oneness and simplicity, and infinitude entailing freedom from all limitation. For Nasser, reflecting upon these divine attributes taken together suffices to solve the problem of evil, which he views as proceeding from an insufficiently metaphysical conception of God's nature. In order to understand what he means, it will first be helpful to say more about how exactly he understands the nature of metaphysics. According to Nasser, metaphysics is not properly speaking a branch of philosophy. Rather, it comprises philosophy's very root as the highest of all sciences which is to say that metaphysics is the science of ultimate reality. And using the term science here, which Nasser intends in its pre-modern sense, he means to distinguish his conception of metaphysics from that of thinkers who see in it nothing beyond unverifiable speculation. For Nasser, there are two main problems with this view. First is its Kantianism, which he rejects. And second is the notion that metaphysics is limited to mental activity alone. As already mentioned, the heart of metaphysics as understood by Nasser is gnosis, which is a mode of knowing that transcends thought. It can therefore be seen that insofar as metaphysics involves doctrines or more loosely, the human intellect's capacity for speculative theorizing, these aspects can only be outward vis-a-vis -vis what is essentially an inexpressible state of consciousness. To return then to the divine attributes upon which Nasser bases his theodicy, we are now in a good position to understand how his conception of God might differ from that of a theologian or rationalist philosopher, neither of whose methods go beyond the subject-object dichotomy presupposed by discursive thinking. For Nasser, 
the oneness of God demands the ultimately illusory nature of any and all dualities, a non-duality that entails God's not being limited by his own divinity, so to speak. When one thinks of God, it is natural to imagine him as being somewhere out there, perhaps seated upon his throne at the summit of the cosmic hierarchy, which is not wrong from Nasser's point of view. But to stop there risks making an idol of the world, since to think of God only as he exists in relation to his creation contradicts his absoluteness. In Nasser's metaphysics, God is absolute with a true absoluteness, which is to say that in and of itself the world is devoid of being. And God is infinite with a true infinitude, which is to say that he is not bound by his own unboundedness. Now in Nasser's explication of this second principle in particular, God's infinitude can be thought of in terms of possibility, in which case one can say that the divine, which is all possibility, comprehends all that is possible, including the possibility of its own negation, or of the mysterious imposition of limits upon that which is always essentially free in itself. Such, for Nasser, is the origin of the world in God. From this metaphysical vantage point, which could be called emanationist, the existentiation of the cosmos entails separation from its source, which in turn necessitates the appearance of evil, since only God is good. More specifically, Nasser characterizes the creation of the world as a projection toward nothingness and evil as, quote, a kind of crystallization of nothingness, real on its own level of existence, but an illusion before God, who alone is reality as such, end quote. Correctly understanding evil from Nasser's point of view, therefore requires avoiding two pitfalls. One being the denial of the reality of evil insofar as it is real, and the other being the false attribution of reality to it insofar as it is not. On the side of the subject then, theodicy demands an epistemology based upon discernment between the absolute and the relative. While on the side of the object, it demands ontological hierarchy or gradation in the category of being. Here one might ask, however, this particular possibility, that of cosmogenesis, is actually brought to pass, given the close conceptual relationship between possibility and contingency. For Nasser, God's creative act proceeds from his goodness, as it is in the nature of the good to communicate and give of itself. So while on the level of abstract attributes like absoluteness and infinitude, their very meanings imply God's not being limited by them. On the level of God's positive qualities or perfections, for example, goodness or beauty, there is a sense in which his own nature constrains him to be just those things. In a word, God cannot will not to be God. God is not free not to create, but it is imposes this limitation upon his own self in virtue of his freedom from all limitation. As Nasser has explained at length in various works, integral metaphysics distinguishes between two main levels or aspects of divinity. Namely, God as pure being, or the personal God of theology, and God as beyond being, or the ultimately real, which is metaphysically infinite. And it is, in fact, the failure to make this distinction, according to Nasser, that leads to so many theological aporias, including the problem of evil. From the perspective of the divine essence, which is beyond both being and, a fortiori, the duality of good and evil, God does not oppose the existence of evil as such but he does oppose all concrete evils on the level of his will, which belongs not to the essence, but to its first determination as being. Assuming now the metaphysical necessity of both the existence of the cosmos and the presence of evil in it, a further question may arise, namely that of the amount as well as types and degrees of evil found in the world. Could not the world have less evil in it than it does? And could it not exclude the more heinous types of evil? Since this question will be revisited, since this question will be re, will be revisited in what follows, I will only sketch some of the relevant principles here. <clears throat> First is that, from Nasser's point of view, God's creation is overwhelmingly good and beautiful. So, someone pondering the problem of evil must account for the obvious fact of people's differing experiences of the world, while at the same time striving for disinterestedness, which of course excludes any kind of relativism. According to Nasser, the more one is able to step back from the particularities of this or that limited experience, the greater will be one's ability to concretely perceive the ultimate unreality of evil in the face of the good. Naturally, someone immersed in evil will be tempted to see evil everywhere, in spite of the fact that, as Nasser says, quote, 
the ugly is passing accident, while beauty is abiding substance, end quote. Second, <clears throat> while Nasser affirms the doctrine of predestination, he does not take it to contradict free will, which for him, people must have if moral evil is to have any meaning. So if certain forms of moral evil are found in the world, an important part of the explanation is simply that God made man free to do as he pleases. Lastly, although Nasser says that it can be understood perfectly well why God, who is pure goodness, creates a world in which there is evil, it is not possible to understand an individual evil in and of itself, since evil is not only characterized by ontological privation, which all things share vis-a-vis -vis God, but is also ontologically insubstantial, a tenebrous mode of existence that manifests itself epistemically as unintelligibility. At best, man can only understand this or that evil in its providential context, for the goodness of God demands that all of what appears as evil contribute to and ultimately be effaced by a greater good. Nevertheless, human beings do not possess God's measures. It is thus that, according to Nasser, the problem of evil is best solved by living a life that would make possible the dawning of sacred knowledge within one's own being. As he says, quote, this realization or actualization is the best possible way of understanding the nature of the good and the why of terrestrial human existence, which being removed from God cannot but be marred by the fragmentation, dissipation, and privation that appears as evil and that is as real as that plane of reality upon which it manifests itself." End quote. If the key to Nasser's solution to the problem of evil lies in his conception of the divine nature, the key to his approach to suffering lies in his conception of the nature of man. In Nasser's anthropology, the human state is fundamentally determined by two aspects or poles. On the one hand, man is made in the image of God, the truth that Islam expresses through its doctrine of man's vicegerency, khilafah, according to which man is the representative of God on earth. On the other hand, man is only ever God's servant, abd, a status entailed by his utter poverty in the face of the divine. For Nasser, the purpose of human life is fulfilled by giving each of these two aspects of the soul its due, so that one recovers his or her primordial nature, fitra, which serves as a kind of gate opening out onto the liberating perfection exemplified for Muslims by the Prophet Muhammad. Now, given the fact that every positive quality admits of being inverted and made into a vice, man qua vicegerent is in danger of becoming proud and man qua servant is in danger of becoming abject. So vicegerency, which pertains to the divine spark within man and servitude, which pertains to his creatureliness must interpenetrate and inform each other in order for this polarity to be resolved into a higher unity. At the same time, Nasser is careful to explain a certain asymmetry whereby servitude proceeds and is presupposed by vicegerency. From one point of view, all human beings are both representative and servant, whether they are aware of it or not. But from another point of view, there is a sense in which all people are called to be servants, whereas not all people are called to be representatives. For the purpose of understanding Nasser's account of suffering, one could say that from the first of these two perspectives, it is the unresolved tension between the divine and creaturely aspects of the human state that causes suffering in the most fundamental sense. Whereas from the second perspective, it is caused by the need to sacrifice the lower self in order to attain to the higher self, or rather the one true self, alienation from which renders all happiness fleeting and ultimately false. In any case, the underlying ailment is one for Nasser. As he says, quote, the cause of all separation, division, otherness, and ultimately suffering is ignorance and the cure knowledge, end quote. As for all the forms of suffering imposed upon man from without by his environment, these are explainable from two main points of view. One, objective or macrocosmic, and the other subjective or microcosmic. From the objective point of view, which comprises an aspect of subjectivity, man's experience of the world must involve suffering on account of the world's ontological status, which entails not only biological imperfection and decay, but also a multiplicity of goods, both real and apparent. Insofar as man participates along with other animals in the state of embodiment, he will experience illness, injury, and death. And insofar as he is distinct from other animals in possessing the freedom to choose, 
individual people are liable to suffer the negative consequences of any and all wrong choices, whether made by them or not. Alternatively, from the subjective point of view, which comprises an aspect of objectivity, the nature of the human state demands suffering in virtue of its imperative of perfection. In Islamic terms, man is unique among creatures on account of God's having taught Adam all the names. Quran chapter 2, verse 31. According to Nasser, quote, this means that God has placed within human nature an intelligence that is central and the means by which he can know all things. It also means that human beings themselves are the theophany or visible manifestation of all of God's names, end quote. Thinking in terms of the human vocation then, one could say that the perfection of God demands the perfection of man. But since man is not one in the same way God is, obviously, his being qualified by God's perfections involves a passage or movement from potentiality to actuality. In order to be perfect, man must be free, but freedom exercised by an imperfect creature in a domain characterized by multiplicity perforce involves the possibility of error, which as already mentioned, forms one of the roots of suffering. Turning now from the fact of human suffering to the details of its role in the quest for happiness, it is first important to point out that Nasser's emphasis on knowledge should not be taken to imply any denigration of the spiritual significance of love. On the contrary, not only does Nasser draw explicit connections between love and suffering in the context of the spiritual life, but he also explains how, at the highest level, the realities of knowledge and love coincide. Thus, in interpreting his claim that the cause of suffering is ignorance and the cure knowledge, Knowledge must be understood here as encompassing not only direct intellectual apprehension, which is non-discursive, but also the concomitance of this apprehension on the level of the soul. On the one hand, the notion of seeking, of course, implies desire. And in the case of the sincere search for true knowledge, it further implies a love that is pure or a purifying love, since knowledge is not something cheap. On the other hand, the reality of attainment implies both compassion and generosity, since divine knowledge is intrinsically good, and the inward being of the true Gnostic is not cluttered with anything that could obstruct the outward radiation of this good. As Nasser explains, quote, the heart of the saint is the source of a light resulting from his inner illumination and of a warmth issuing from the fire of the love of God. Knowledge and love at this level are united in a single reality, like the light and heat of a fire, the locus of this sacred fire being the heart." End quote. Now, just as subjectively speaking, the comprehensiveness of the human state demands the possibility of vice, so too does the totality of cosmic manifestation demand ambiguity on the level of objective phenomena. It is thus that fire can both benefit and harm, and that by analogy, the imperishable fire comprising man's very center mysteriously becomes capable of burning him, a possibility opened up by the scission between subject and object precisely. It is not without reason then that Nasser speaks not only of the fire of love, but also of the fire of the passions. From the point of view of this symbolism, the crucial question for man in his quest for happiness is that of his welfaring in respect of the fire within him. For what does this fire burn? with what does he feed it, and in what manner does it finally burn him? Insofar as it burns with the love of God, man sacrifices himself at the altar of this love, which in consuming him frees him of the dross of his own separative existence. For such a person, the alchemy of love makes a medicine of suffering regardless of its proximate cause. If it comes from without, then it aids the lover in abandoning that which will never fully satisfy him. And if it comes from within, it aids him in abandoning his own self for that which will. Contrarywise, insofar as man succumbs to the fire of his passions, which he feeds with gratifications while heedless of God, he is really only feeding it with his self, which in being so consumed is condemned to suffer in vain. In the language of the Quran, God does not wrong people in the least, rather it is people who wrong themselves. Earlier, we began with Nasser's claim that the presence of the evil in the world is a necessary concomitant of cosmogenesis. Taking this doctrine for granted, we then pose the question of whether the world might not have less evil in it than it does, or only certain types or degrees of evil. 
Surely, as mentioned, the postulate of human freedom is indispensable to any compelling response to this question. But we could have probed the initial cosmological picture a bit more, as it is not immediately apparent why separation would have to manifest itself as evil on any given level of reality. Since celestial modes of existence and freedom of will in the most general sense are not mutually exclusive, to say the least. Thinking in terms of geometrical symbolism, could not the emanation of the cosmos, which can be envisaged as proceeding spherically out from its originary center, have been halted before the conditions for the appearance of evil were met? Why did God not just make the world unambiguously paradisal from the start? The most profound and purely metaphysical answer to this question is simply that God is one, for oneness implies totality. But one could also say, slightly less elliptically, that to say God is to say world, and to say world is to say man. As we have already seen, God creates because it is in his nature to do so, or because he is who he is. And his creation includes man on pain of the name Allah not receiving its rights, so to speak. Furthermore, the world, which is finite, must be so indefinitely, since otherwise the sphere of the cosmos would be limited by nothingness, which is absurd. It would be as though the aforementioned logical possibility of a kind of paradisal orb were to be suspended in a void, with its inhabitants being able to stroll along its boundary and peer out into emptiness. But such a world could not contain man, since the very nature of man is distinguished from the natures of other things precisely by its mysterious ability to encompass the extremes of manifested existence within itself, from nothing properly so called to the nothingness of the divine. So the world contains moral evil, including its most abhorrent forms, because it contains man. And it contains man because principial oneness demands manifested totality. Now, as satisfying as such explanations may be for those who are predisposed to find traditional metaphysical doctrines compelling, some might wonder at what are liable to appear as cavalier appeals to necessity. In saying that infinitude entails finitude, or that oneness demands totality, how should these metaphysical modes of implication be understood? Can things be other than they are? What is the relationship to, between necessity, possibility, and freedom? In the context of the problem of evil, God is absolved of evil by the freedom of man, but the nature of man is nevertheless determined by God. It is thus that theodicy is, as Nasser has noted, closely related to the problem of free will and predestination, to which we now turn. In Nasser's metaphysics, God is both pure necessity and pure freedom. And since only God is absolute, only he possesses these attributes in an absolute manner. In the human domain, by contrast, there can be neither absolute necessity nor absolute freedom, since the world is relative by definition. According to Nasser, the oneness of freedom and necessity on the divine level manifests itself as mutual limitation on the level of relativity. Man, then, is neither fully determined nor fully free. Regarding the relationship between the question of free will and predestination and the problem of evil, understanding it requires specifying the exact meanings of necessity and freedom as they relate to both God and man. Metaphysically speaking, necessity refers simply to realities, reality with capital R, refers simply to realities being what it is, and freedom refers to its illimitability. God exists by his very nature, and since he does not change, he cannot not be. Relying upon nothing, therefore, and possessing no partners in virtue of his oneness, God is exalted above anything that can place a limit upon his freedom. As for man, all of whose endowments, of course, come from God, his participation in divine freedom transpires within the limits of a predetermined destiny, since the changelessness and perfection of the divine entail everything's already being accomplished in reality. From this lofty point of view, or at this level, which in theoretical Sufism is called wahidiya, or oneness as inclusive of manyness, things simply are what they are, with the upshot for human freedom being that a person is only ever free to become what he or she always already is on the level of his or her unmanifested individuality. In this doctrine, which in the Islamic world found its most profound expression in the writings of Ibn Arabi and his followers, the objects of God's knowledge are uncreated, and insofar as they enter into manifestation, 
God in his justice bestows upon them that which their own natures demand, no more and no less. Thus, if someone were to accept that it is man and not God who is responsible for moral evil, but then wonder why God makes human nature to be what it is, one answer is simply that human nature is not something made. God does not create the objects of his own knowledge. Rather, he simply knows what he knows. It is also helpful to recall here the concept of divine wisdom for the obvious reason that, as already mentioned, man does not possess God's measures. In the context of Islam, one is reminded of the Quranic passage in which the angels question God's decision to make man his representative on earth. Quote, and when thy Lord said to the angels, I am placing a vicegerent upon the earth, they said, wilt thou place therein one who will work corruption therein and shed blood while we hymn thy praise and call thee holy? He said, truly I know what you know not. And he taught Adam the names, all of them, end quote. All things, their good and their evil, are determined from the start. But man is free to fail to appreciate the fact, in which case he lives beneath himself and suffers on account of his ignorance. Being thus estranged from the paradise of his own primordial nature, which participates in divine knowledge, he forfeits his supreme opportunity, which is, which is to abandon even that for God himself, in whom alone evil is seen to have never really been. Thank you. Thank you so much, Essen. Great work. Uh, I'm going to go over some of the questions. Uh, let me see. So we have uh, this question first. Uh, excellent and stimulating presentation, first of all. You mentioned something about the hysteria as an aspect of modern culture. We can certainly witness it surrounding the pandemic and how the war in Europe, and, and now the war in Europe. Would you please elaborate this point as I consider extremely important to fathoming the depth descent that the so-called modern period has taken humanity? Yeah, the, the main idea was just that when everyone, um, when the pot sort of gets stirred, that the question arises of, uh, you know, what the best thing to do is. And in a lot of cases, um, because of an ambience where um, uh, people's experience of life in the world tends to be very exteriorized, and there's sort of a, a neglect of the inward dimension of their being, um, that kind of um, ironically, there's a little bit of a shooting yourself in the foot effect um, because you're eager to do something, you feel that you have to do something, um, but oftentimes that's, that's not the right thing to do because the success of anything done outwardly sort of presupposes um, there's certain inward prerequisites that you know the person is reason reasonably centered, balanced, has their head on straight, et cetera. So that was just kind of the, the main point there. It, it was an allusion to, you know, recent events with the COVID pandemic, at least, you know, how I um, experienced it. Granted, I didn't follow the, the news too closely or anything like that. So I was no one to say anything about it with any authority. Um, but yeah, you see this, you know, kind of people getting getting worked up. And um, so, yeah, it's in, in Dr. Nasser's thought, definitely, um, he would emphasize very strongly never to put the card before the horse. Thank you very much. Um, next question is, how do you think uh, Saito Hussein Nasser would respond to the challenges mentioned in Muhammad Farooq's interesting talk on Hume yesterday? The burn fear and agony for days before dying and the horribly abused five-year-old girl. The possibility of perfection seems to be beyond the reach of the fawn and the girl. I'm thinking of Dostoevsky's The Karmas of Brothers, in which a character says, if this kind of evil must necessarily exist in the world, he chooses to respectfully return his ticket to heaven. Very, very good question. Um, so kind of the, as far as the fawn is concerned, from my point of view, at least, I don't want to speak for Dr. Nasser necessarily, um, but just from the point of view of his general principles, which as is obvious from my talk, probably I find compelling um, from on the basis of my own understanding, 
The most profound answer to that is just to ask what a fawn is to begin with um, and how it is that it comes into existence and um, and uh, what the prerequisites of its existence, so to speak, are. So in Islamic, um, kind of in the inward aspect of the Islamic tradition, um, Dr. Farouk himself, I, I believe he mentioned this notion of the, the perfect human being, al-insan al-kamil. So in these doctrines, the, the root nature of man or the most sort of profound substance, so to speak, of the human state contains everything in a sense. It's uh, in, in Akbari terms, um, it's a barzakh. It's the highest barzakh between God and the world. So um, the, the human being and sort of its full reality is actually quite a profound um, and even exalted thing. So the fawn, uh, from this point of view, everything in the world is an exterior, exteriorization um, of that reality. Sometimes Ibn Arabi even refers to it as the reality of realities, haqiqat al-haqaiq. So everything found in the world is an exteriorization of that reality. And kind of going on the basis of this um, picture that Dr. Nasser painted for us yesterday of emanation and sort of increasing distance from the source, if you can see everything in the world as the outward elaboration of the fundamental substance uh, of man, there will be varying degrees of proximities to the to that you know integral reality. So, um, cosmologically speaking, when you're thinking about it using a, a vertical symbolism, at the lowest level you have matter, or even in ancient and medieval thought, you know, this prime matter it, it doesn't even exist, all the way up to you know angels and things like that. But in the terrestrial domain. Um, we have this intuitive sense that um, animals are closer to us than plants are or minerals, et cetera. So, um, so that's number one, what, what is a fawn? You have to situate it kind of um, um, uh, philosophically, cosmologically, metaphysically. So the fawn um, is just when we see the fawn, ideally we see an aspect of our own selves. And this is sort of like the hikmah, the wisdom, one might say from the Islamic point of view of, uh, of the creation is that in a sense, it's, it's all for the human being. Um, and at, at the highest level of spirituality, um, these saints, they look everywhere and, and they see God. Everything is, um, you know, uh, a dhikr for them. So if this fawn is, you know, burning and dying in the forest fire, um, ultimately, so my talk, you know, was maybe a little bit provocative in that it's um, kind of um, trying to, Dr. Nasser, the whole idea of gnosis, of what is um, the, the human being capable of understanding. So there's a danger of giving the impression that, oh, you know, man himself can be omniscient or something like this. No, not at all. The, in the last, first of all, uh, the, the concept of gnosis presupposes kind of the extinction of the knower. Um, and second of all, just generally speaking, at the end of the day, a finite human intelligence obviously cannot um, comprehend an infinite principle. So unavoidably in any sort of truly difficult or sort of hairy question, you're not gonna be able to definitively resolve it um, on the level of your mind alone. You can sort of give yourself mental keys and create certain openings. Um, so for depending on the person, the case of the fawn, maybe that sort of thing, or, or maybe not, you know, how many, how many keys um, does it need? Will they satisfy, et cetera? But yeah, if the fawn is a uh, kind of um, uh, an externalized aspect of our own selves, Let's just imagine if someone chanced, chanced upon the fawn. Of course, that's not in the example. It's <laughs> suffering alone in vain. Um, but um, anyways, I think that that suffices. Uh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think we need to move on a bit. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions. Uh, I, I'm not sure we have time for all of them. So I'll, I'll summarize uh, as, I, as much as I can. 
Um, the next question uh, asks you about what we do in a first person address to someone in position of overwhelming suffering. And uh, what can I say to myself in my own moment of suffering that draws on these metaphysical distinctions? Maybe you can just answer very briefly. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Zargar yesterday kind of uh, touched upon, um, explained a relevant point, which is like, you just have to gauge your state in the moment. So, you know, oftentimes very sensitive things that human beings say, um, it, it depends upon your intention and the, the place and the time and all this stuff. So if you get the intuitive immediate sense that you're in a position um, to say something good and that occurs to you, um, then go for it. And if you're not, then silence, um, you know, silence is, uh, is never um, a bad option. Um, but the, as far as yourself and this is kind of going back to the idea of putting the cart before the horse, um, you know, contemplating these matters themselves in a general way and sort of trying to understand them to the best of one's ability. That's the best first step because if you think deeply about it and you come upon some insights and you assimilate those truly um, and, you know, you talk to yourself about it in this internal dialogue, monologue, um, first, when anything, you know, God forbid bad happens to you, you'll have that to go upon for your own self. And then if, uh, if anything ever happens to anyone that's a part of your life, you, you may be in that special position if the moment is right and the place and you're in the right state, you feel your intention is pure, um, et cetera. So yeah, it depends upon a lot of factors, but the priority would just be trying to reflect, understand, um, and assimilate. Okay, thank you so much. I'm afraid I think we are running out of time. Uh, Dr. Farooq, you raise your hand. And uh, Dr. Mansouri. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, yeah, I mean, but it does seem like we don't have much time left, mm -hmm. but I just felt like because this was related to my talk as well, uh, I would add some uh, comments and also I have a related question to, uh, maybe we can come back to some of this maybe later, but very briefly, um, uh, there can be many you know, responses to that. One is the idea uh, uh, that, uh, first of all, um, this is taking place in the context of what some people have called a metaphysics of relation. So it's not the Cartesian world of the subject and object or simply individual beings completely separated from each other. When you're talking about any animals, man, human beings, and so forth, in a, it, all of them have to be understood in terms of a kind of um, a relationality. Uh, once that is understood, and then the next question is about the understanding the totality of their existential return. So those cases mentioned by William you know, Rowe, the, the philosopher and the, the animal suffering or innocent girl being raped, one can think of even more horrible cases. And in fact, even in the Quran, actually in the Quran itself, there are those stories. Remember in the, in the, in the, in, in the, in the chapter, uh, I think, um, Surah Kahf, uh, there, there's the story where Moses kills uh, this uh, innocent boy, right? And and Hither, the figure who was leading uh, Moses, he, uh, sorry, 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 I said that. Hither, or the mysterious figure accompanying Moses, the prophet Moses, kills an innocent boy, and this enrages um, Moses, and and, and he said, "Lapadiji tashe and nukra." It's I've done a horrible thing. You know, there's no justification killing an innocent boy out of nowhere. And then it was revealed that this boy was going to be a tyrant and so forth. Uh, so one does not, one cannot measure uh, the temporal scale of an earthly life or what's happening here uh, in comparison with the totality of the eternal uh, cycle of, of a given entity's you know, existence. So there might be further stages down that, uh, we simply do not know, but that might bring negative consequences and so forth. Uh, of course, uh, this is one response that might be satisfactory or not, but I, I think I would just stop there. Uh, because Thanks, I just Mama. Thank you so much. I think it to, to um, avoid the evil of giving next presenters less time, I need to just, uh, maybe uh, the other questions you can address directly by email to the, um, to the presenter.